Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. Uh, this teaching is the Bible Apologetics and our foundation, and it's the Creation and Flood series. It's Lesson 1. So today I'm continuing a study on some specific subjects contained in the book of Genesis, specifically the events found in Genesis chapter 1 through 11. And it's including God's creation of everything, uh, Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel and some other lessons in between there, some extra things we're going to learn. This lesson today is necessary for us to set the foundation for our study because we must establish first a foundation of what we believe. This study is not going to be just a quick retelling of events of Genesis, but will include a, a lot of questions and answers about the facts of God's great historical book. I mean, we're going to be going over many details and answers to questions that evolutionists that don't believe and those who used to believe in the Bible but have strayed from their faith in the Bible as the true word of God. It's apologetic in its structure as the foundation of faith, a strong defense for the validity of God's word and revealing the truth of the Bible and what it tells us about the early years of creation just a mere almost 6,000 years ago. Since I was a young child, I had always been fascinated by God's creation as I read, it, was, it was read to me from Genesis. As I've grown, I've always believed that the Bible is the Word of God, and the study it has been my lifelong passion. As, at school, I heard conflicting explanations about the age of Earth and about the evolutionary theory and presented uh, by these people as fact, which I did not believe. Now, I, I went to college and I heard more theories. Uh, by some people that did not line up with Scripture either. Even though they were at a, at a Christian college, they weren't saying what the Bible was saying in some instances. See, in having a solid foundation laid down by my mother uh, teaching the Bible, it was something important. It was further built on by a, a man at our church, Byron Spillman. He's the one that used to drive my family to church every week because we didn't have a car. And then my pastor, his name was uh, Dr. Gary Musgrove, um, he, he was great in teaching and preaching. And then my favorite Bible college professor, Dr. Paul Hackett, he really spoke some words into my life. You know, plus my own studies over the years has helped me to examine and deeply uh, understand things from a biblical perspective. To understand the truth about creation and the flood, we have to turn to the only source of real truth, and that's the Bible. To be able to explain what we believe about God and the Bible, we need to know uh, what we believe and why we believe it. Many Christians coast through life and never really understand it. They can't really defend their faith. And how can we defend our faith, which is the goal uh, of our foundation of apologetics, unless we go to the source of truth? So let's find this out. Where do we get the Bible? Well, in asking that question, ultimately, we must answer that which we received it from God. It, it, it's a fact that the Bible claims for itself. I mean, I closed our, our last lesson with the Apostle Paul saying in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. See, the biblical word for inspired means uh, the scripture is breathed out by God. It says, it's, it's done by the breath of God. See, the Apostle Peter describes this process in 2 Peter uh, 1, 20-21. It says, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. God breathed out his word by using godly men to write down exactly what he wanted them to write. Christians use a number of words to describe what they believe about the Bible. And it's something that we can see here. There are three common words Christians use which are inspired, inerrant, and infallible. But if you're new to the faith or if you haven't grown up around the church, these words can be a little confusing. So what do they mean? Well, inspired. When we say that the Bible is inspired, we mean that God is it's a definitive author. He is the definitive author, author of the word. 
Well, God used human beings to record his words. It's God himself who is behind what they wrote. God didn't just inspire the big ideas behind the Bible, but the very words of Scripture. To be clear, we don't believe these human writers became like robots or fell into a trance and mindlessly penned God's word and his, his message. God breathed out his message, moving them along to record what he wanted, yet without making them something less than human agents. So then, inerrant. When we say the Bible is inerrant, we mean God used these human authors to pen exactly what God wanted without a mixture of error. God used these men with all their personalities, their writing styles, their accumulated vocabularies, their life experiences, their illustrations, and their metaphors to express his message as he wanted it, yet without error. In that way, the Bible has a dual authorship, God and man. Yet we recognize it that it's God himself who is behind the Bible's message and authority. The next word is infallible. When we say the Bible is infallible, we mean that God's word is incapable of error. Because God is perfect, so his revelation of himself is perfect. God's word will accomplish exactly what God wants it to. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. What we believe about God and what we believe about the Bible are intertwined and cannot be separated. What we know about God comes from the Bible. Hebrews 6.18 says that God cannot lie. If the Bible is God's word to us, if it, it can't lie then his word must be incapable of error. Skeptics might quickly challenge this as being a form of circular reasoning. They might say, oh, you believe in, in God because the Bible tells you to, and you believe in the Bible because God tells you to, in the Bible. And to be fair, I mean, the Bible does say that. But circular reasoning is a problem for the skeptic too, and they can easily lie. But Christians should believe what God says because he is incapable of lying. So therefore, his word does not have lies. So we need to look at the Bible as our ultimate authority. Every way of the, seeing the world, every worldview begins with a commitment that cannot be proven outside of that particular worldview. Consider a rationalist, for example. A rationalist is a person who believes human reason is the chief authority for understanding the world. If you ask them to defend this position, they would give you a, rash, a rational response. They would presuppose their worldview to be true in order to argue for it. This is true of every worldview. The Christian begins with the commitment that God exists and that he has revealed himself which he has, and that's in the Bible, through and through other ways. The Bible is a coherent story written by 40 authors in three languages over 1,500 years. It makes sense of the world we live in, where the world came from, and what it means to be human. The Bible is inspired. God is its ultimate author. The Bible is inerrant. God used human authors to write exactly what he wanted without error. And the Bible is infallible because it is incapable of error and will accomplish exactly what God wants. See how that works? The Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible word of God. Every person who has experienced a life-transforming encounter with Jesus understands the importance of the power of the word of God for their lives. Now, here's what we need to understand defending our belief in the Word of God. See, to defend our belief in the Word of God and our position in the book of Genesis, account of creation, the flood, and the Tower of Babel, as well as the fall of mankind and God's promise of Redeemer, it will help us to become effective apologists, which is important because we're called to defend our faith. This isn't really hard to do. It just takes believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord, believing in the Word of God, and memorizing some key concepts. The Apostle Peter made it clear that every Christian needs to be ready to defend the faith. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. 
yet do it with gentleness and respect. In fact, defending the faith is an essential uh, component of evangelism of the lost. Yet Christians often find this command difficult and intimidating because some highly educated people have argued that scientific evidence refutes the claims of the Bible. Well, how can we answer such people unless we, we know a lot of science? Well, it's understandable that many Christians feel inadequate to respond to the lawfully rhetoric and twisted logic of the academic elite. But this doesn't need to bother us, and it's not necessary. The Bible gives every one of us, regardless of age or formal education, the basic tools we need to defend the faith. We don't have to have all the science, all the other background. A person doesn't need an advanced degree in science or theology. Anyone can do it. We simply have to understand a few basic biblical principles. See, because we have competing worldviews. When we defend the Christian faith, we must avoid the temptation to get sidetracked on secondary issues or of scientific arguments. The goal is to quickly hone in on the heart of the matter because the debate is ultimately an issue of competing worldviews, theirs against ours, or ours against theirs. We all have a worldview, a way of thinking about life in the universe that shapes our understanding of what we observe. But not all worldviews are equal, and not all worldviews are correct. Non-Christian worldviews always have internal defects. Why? Because they reject the Bible at their foundation, and they end up being inconsistent, arbitrary, and ultimately irrational. With practice, anyone can learn to identify these flaws. The Bible tells that genuine knowledge begins with a reverential, uh, being reverent and, and having a submission to God. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So to have a worldview that is consistently rational, we must begin with God's word as the foundation by which we evaluate the facts. Only God knows everything, so only he is in the position to tell us on his own authority, what our starting point should be. Only the Bible provides a logical foundation for those things that are essential for knowledge. What are the requirements for knowledge? Well, in order for human beings to have genuine knowledge of any topic, certain things would have to be true, whether we recognize it consciously or we don't. For example, the human mind has to be capable of rational thought. The universe has to be orderly and comprehensible. In other words, we, we have to understand it. It has to be understandable. Our sensations of the world around us have to be basically reliable. The Christian worldview can make sense of all these things. The Christian understands that God made the human mind so that we can have the ability to think rationally. God made the universe and it upholds it in a consistent, logical way. He does that. God created our senses so that we could have accurately probed the world around us. In fact, without God, we have no reason to expect an understandable universe. So although there is a place for discussing scientific details, it's good to remember that science itself is based on a Christian worldview. Now we're going to talk about more of that later in further, further lessons, but we must be patiently getting the unbelievers to realize that they couldn't even do science if their evolutionary worldview were true. See, if the universe was just the aftermath of a Big Bang, why would we expect it to be orderly or comprehensible or the mind to be capable of rational analysis? If the universe is just matter in motion, then how could there be abstract laws such as mathematics and logic which are required for rational thinking. This isn't to say that non-Christians cannot know things. Obviously they can, because God made them. But this is possible only because they are inconsistently trying to rely on biblical principles. Remember, rational thinking comes from God, while simultaneously denying the Bible. And this is the important thing to keep back in the back of our minds during any discussion about worldviews and Christianity. In the end, we know that Christianity is true because if it were not, then we couldn't know anything at all because all knowledge comes from God. Now, something that will help us 
is what's called the, the don't answer, answer strategy of Proverbs 26. First of all, remember, don't allow an unbeliever to set rules for conversation and discussion. We don't have to follow what they say. King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all you have to do is look at, at 2 Timothy 3.16 to find that out, uh, gave us the strategy to expose the defects in non-Christian worldviews in two verses of Proverbs 26. The first one, Proverbs 26.4, it states, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Now to be clear, the Bible is not engaged it's not engaging in name calling by using the word fool here, and neither should we, as it says in Matthew 20, 5.22. But instead, the Bible uses this word to describe anyone who has rejected God's revelation. Proverbs 1.7, and also in Psalms 14.1. See, by rejecting the biblical God, uh, the unbeliever has given up the foundational truths necessary for knowledge. That's foolish. His position is irrational or foolish in the Hebrew word, meaning of the word. Now, when an unbeliever tries to set the term of the conversation by saying things like, well, you can't use the Bible uh, in your argument or miracles or are not allowed as a legitimate explanation, they're embracing an illogical starting point for this thinking. It, it, is, in, it is an inappropriate, inappropriate to agree to such terms, so don't do it. If they say you can't, don't do it. Don't do what they're telling you to do. According to the Bible, we should not answer a fool according to his folly, or else we become like him. We know that the Bible and miracles are true, so therefore they are a part of our argument. See, this is that we should never embrace the unbeliever's starting point, or else we too will end up just like him, holding a worldview in which knowledge doesn't make sense. Now, the second, the, the next verse in Proverbs is 26.5. It states, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, at first glance, this verse may sound as if it contradicts the previous one, but the last part of each verse makes it quite clear that the sense is different. Verse 5 indicates that we should show the fool that he isn't as wise as he thinks he is, by illustrating where he is thinking will lead. In other words, while we are never embrace the unbeliever's starting point, as in don't answer, we can temporarily use his starting point to answer for the sake of argument to show that it leads to an absurd result, very absurd result. For example, if evolution were true, we should have no reason to depend on our brain to know that it's true because our brain is a result of chance mutations. That's ridiculous. I mean, this is an inconsistency, and their view is not rational. Then we go to the answer part of the strategy and show that the critic's position is inconsistent. For instance, using the common complaint of unbelievers, how can you believe the Bible in this age of science and technology? Science has proven that the Bible is not true. Well, using the biblical don't answer, answer strategy, we can reply, Science has not disproved the Bible. On the contrary, science has confirmed the Bible in many areas, in many ways. Then we could give some examples at this point. Now, these, these examples are easy to find on several creationist websites. You can go to answersingenesis.org, icr.org, genesisapologetics.org. These are just some of the, a few of the ones that I know of. Then we, we can move to the answer part of the strategy. But for the sake of argument, how would science even be possible in the first place unless the Bible claims about God were true? Then we patiently explain that the principles of science, such as the order and uniformity of the nature and the ability of the mind to understand the universe, all ultimately come from the Bible. Remembering that all knowledge is from Christ, we can quickly get to the heart of the matter and expose the irrationality in any attack on Christianity. We can see that in Colossians 2.3. Using the don't answer answer strategy of Proverbs 26.4-5, we can efficiently expose the inconsistency of each example of unbiblical reasoning. Now Jesus tells us to build our house upon the rock, his teachings, not the shifting sands of human opinion. 
We see that in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. By standing on the authority of the Bible, we can give a powerful and respectful and great defense of the, of the faith. God can bless our efforts and will use our defense to draw many people to himself. This also helps us to understand better our position in what we believe. All it takes for us to do is to take our belief in God much more seriously than we have in the past. And then being an effective Christian apologist, here's what we need to do. Uh, the writer Jason uh, Liesel uh, gives some suggestions to help us do what is, this is called four keys to being an effective Christian apologist. Four keys to being a Christian apologist. The first one is sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Remember that all knowledge is in Christ, Colossians 2, 3, and so our defense, which is apologetic, should be based unashamedly on the, on the person of Christ as revealed in his word. We can show that any system of thought, if it is not based ultimately on biblical revelation, is inherently irrational. The next point is to be ready always to give a defense. In obedience to our Lord, we should continually study the Bible and read about the common issues in apologetics so that we'll be prepared. Thinking through the issues and studying the scriptures is a lifelong process that will continually improve our defense of the faith. I've done that for many years and I still have to do more. The next one is to everyone who asks a reason of hope that is in you. Why do you have hope? Remember, that's our job, to give a good defense of those who ask. We should not be discouraged if the person is not persuaded as long as we've given a good biblical uh, faithful reason for our faith. If they say, what's the reason for your hope? We give it. See, a change of heart is the job of the Holy Spirit. We're the tool to do the work. He does the fulfilling. He does the saving. He does the changing. Now, the next one is with gentleness and respect. And this is very important. To be a good apologist, we have to be respectful. Our defense should never be emotionally charged or derisive or sarcastic. Remember, even those who are in rebellion against God are made in his image and deserve respect. So we should be kind, not hateful. Remember, we must be ready to give an account of what we believe. Very important, because how else can we tell people about Jesus? Now, in our next lessons, we're going to begin studying what the Bible tells us about creation and, and how we can know it's true. And I'll, I'll spend some time going through the different points of uh, creation, and we'll talk about um, some of the views that people have against it and what we, we know the Bible says is true about it. There's a lot of great stuff out there, and I really want to, I'm looking forward to spend some time with you going through the creation and the flood and all this. Uh, I, I just really want to, uh, I'm excited about it. I just want to share that. So uh, let's continue studying. And, uh, but I do want to thank you for joining in with me today. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we can come to you, that we can study the word of God. We can know how to place before us that which you have desired for us to learn. I ask that you would help us to be good apologists, good Christians, good defenders of the faith, a good understanding, have a good understanding of, of what your word says, that we will be good uh, stewards of the word, that we'll be good scholars of the word, that we will rightly divide the, tro the truth and showing that we, we are doing the right way that the Holy Spirit shows us to do it. Lord, help us to be the people that you call us to be and that we'll do everything we can to see the lost saved. Lord, help us Help us to be strong in our faith and to love you and to show your love to others. We thank you so much for it. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Well, I want us to, to remember something. If you'd like to find out more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, uh, just send me an email at info at centerpoints.org. Uh, you can go to our website at www.centerpoints.org. Or if you'd like to find out our video, uh, all our videos that have been recorded so far and placed online, including this one, you just go to www.youtube.com forward slash the at symbol CPCF forward slash videos. 
or you can like today's you can see on online on our website or you can see them on on facebook and then i put a an outline with my sermons and the, and the teachings usually uh, every sunday uh, you can download those especially if you look in the narrative uh, on the days they're presented or on youtube they're always there so i want to encourage you to do that if you have any questions at all just please contact me if you need prayer uh, you need to ask a question about something theological uh, just send me that email at info at soonerpoints.org. So, oh, also, if you want to find out about our Wednesday night Bible study on Zoom or our Thursday morning women's Bible study on Zoom, also send me um, an email and I'll send you a link. Okay, so until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day. <music>